Sir. Is it Tom? Yes, it's Tom. 2024, Happy New Year to you. It is good to be back in the in the rhythms of things. Is it good? Is it good for you? Now, here's a question. Why is that? Then after we go back from holiday and now we're ready to tackle our responsibilities and work or perhaps study. Why is work and responsibility and anxiety feels like they're married to one another? I mean, I work full time for the church. Technically, I work for the Lord. But if I think about projects and people that needs to be launched this year, there's this really real sense of anxiety in my heart. It's like, oh my goodness, how am I going to do this? And and perhaps for some of us, you're the type that you bury yourself at work. My dad, he is 72. He works still from 7.30 in the morning until 8.30 at night. He doesn't have space for anything else. And perhaps maybe that's a space that you feel like you can run away to. But is this how God intended our lives to be? Working to earn blessings, meanwhile not being blessed in the process. Our modern world has this ideal of early retirement, hoping to escape this anxious toil of life early. But I'm asking you a question, if you're retired here and you're watching, has your retirement healed you from anxiety? My assumption is maybe not. We are in the series now called New Beginning. I believe that there is a special grace, special sense of strength as you restart, as you as you close the chapter of last year and, and open the new chapter of your life here in 2024. I believe that God is calling us to resync the trajectory, the rhythms, the the pace of our lives into the rhythm of his grace to divorce our work and our responsibility from anxiety, to work from blessing instead of for blessing. A blessed people in an anxious world. Psalm 127, you can read this together with me. Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand watch in vain. In vain you rise early and stay up late hustling, toiling for food to eat, for he grants sleep for those he loves. Building, watching over things, taking care of things. In this context, it was Solomon. He was building a kingdom, cities, a magnificent temple. He had a, a big responsibilities on his shoulders. He knew what it was like to work hard. He knew what it was like to handle pressure. But it seemed to me somehow that he had learned the art of faith and the art of sleeping well. Don't you want that? Well, if you have a newborn, it's a different story. But this the sense of having an anxious, a non-anxious inner world in the presence of big responsibilities of life. Now, let's start with the word blessing. When you think about the word being blessed or blessing, what comes up to your mind? You know, perhaps this thought, Bless you after you sneeze. I never grew up. I, I didn't grow up like having people saying bless you. In Asia, we don't say that. People just stare at you with disgust and contempt if you sneeze close to them. We only heard it from white people when I moved to Australia. But anyway, the word bless it started here in Genesis. Genesis 1, God created humanity. I mean, God created the world. God created the nature, the ocean, the the water, the light, the mountains, everything. And then he created humans. And this is the first time the word blessed appeared in the Bible. That God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule and take care and look after these things that I've made. The word blessing here has a sense of identity and responsibility. Like an artist with a signature in the corner, God had been making the art, the, the art of the skies. If you see the skies, the oceans, and he put a signature in the corner there. But then when he created you and he created them according to his image, he created humanity, you and I, 
to co-heir, to co-labor, to co-create with him, to be a co-artist a co with him. Is that, a, is that a word? It's an English word. I'm um, English second language. Anyway, the word blessing has to do with identity, who we are, and responsibility, what we do. When we think about the word subdue, it sounds like you're a colonialist, but it wasn't like that. The word subdue, it's like a like a, an assignment to subdue this wild water stream into make irrigation system out of it, make beautiful gardens out of it. Subdue the power of fire and, and meat and vegetables to make beautiful cuisines. Subdue the fruit of the vine to make beautiful wine. Subdue the wind to create electricity. Subdue this raw material that I've created to make a civilization. John McComber in his book, Garden City, if you want to read a book about work and the art of being human, this is such a good book. This is what he said. When you think of Eden, don't think of a public park with a lawn, a place set, and a flower bed or two. It got hands added a land mower and, and says, keep it tidy, will ya? Think of a violent, untamed wilderness, steaming with beauty, with no infrastructure, no roads, no bridges, no cities, no civilization. And God says, let's go make one. Adam was a landscape maintenance employee. He was an explorer, a cartographer, a gardener, a designer, an architect, a builder, an urban planner, a city maker. And that's the origin of work, a blessed work. Where productivity, soulful creativity, excellence, and order, godly order, were divorced from anxious toiling and greed and exploitation and power struggle that you and I are both too familiar with. So when did anxiety, greed, and the ugliness of the spirit of mammon of money come into the picture? Here's the tragedy, tragedy, the tragedy of Adam and Eve choosing to turn away from this umbrella of blessing that God has provided and, and given to them as a gift and traded their state of blessedness, traded their trust and innocence with a lie from a serpent that says, hey, you know what, you can define and create life in your own terms instead of God's. The opposite of blessing, when you run away from, from, from this umbrella of blessing, there's no neutral outside of that, is curse. Being cursed is when God hands you over to the consequences of your own choice. Genesis 3, it says, Curse is the ground because of you through painful toil. This is where blessing, life, fruitfulness, wholesome productivity being trade to curse. Anxious toiling. From healthy subduing, the greedy exploitation and the corruption of human soul. And we do live in the shadow of that curse. Our world is under the curse of sin. So what does it mean to live under God's umbrella of blessing in a cursed world? Bless people in an anxious world. Keep in mind those two things. Blessing has to do with identity, who we are, and responsibility, what we do. Let's start with our identity. Kai, my daughter is going to trade one next week. Can you believe it? It's crazy. She was the other day busy marking her stationery, helping my, my wife with. So she needs to put the sticker on all her belongings, the pencils, the books, whatever. And those things has her name on it. The expectation is that she will look after and take care of the things with her name. When we go here to number 6, 24, 27, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. But this is, this is what it says. They will put my name on the Israelites and I will bless them. The first question on your identity is, who do you belong to? Whose name is, is on your life? Is it God's name or is it the world's? Who do we belong to? 
Jesus at the cross, he took the consequences of all the curse that humanity had ever committed and will ever commit. Internalize it. He became cursed himself, went into deep, dark grave with it, died, crucified, murdered brutally, and rose out of the grave to defeat that curse once and for all. So whoever put their trust in him, whoever believes in him will not die, but live life, a blessed life, an eternal life. When you put your trust in him, there is a sticker with Jesus' name on top of your life that God is responsible for your coming and for your going, for you, for your family, for your kids, for the things that is in your life. He's responsible and he will look after you. No longer that you are a slave to your anxiety. Your identity is no longer defined by your fear, by what people say about you, by the state of your mental health. You have been given a new ID card. You belong to him. You belong to the family of God. You are blessed. You are favored. You have a future in Jesus. You are sons and daughters. You are kings and priests, co-creator, co-heir to his kingdom, assuring this upside down kingdom here on earth in Cape Town or wherever you're watching this as it is in heaven. That through your life, that through your family, the things that you build and you do and who you are, God's kingdom will be established here. God's kingdom of blessing will be established here in the cursed world. When we look at Jesus' interaction here with Peter in Matthew 16, people have been saying, um, who do you think? He's been saying to his disciples, who do you think I am? Some say you're this, some say you're this. But Peter recognized that he says, you are the Messiah. And this is what Jesus replied. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. And I will tell you, this is the th part I want to zoom in, that you are Peter. Blessing. And then he affirmed his identity. You are Peter. It means rock. On this rock, I will build my church. And responsibility. Blessing has to do with identity. He is Peter and his responsibility to usher, to, to be the host of God's building his church upon his life. And the gates of hell will not overcome it. Blessing who you are and what you do. Laura last week had this question and this three things, time, talents, and your treasure. What are we building with our time, with our talents, and our treasure? Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Are we building what God is building? She asked the question, what is God's dream for your life? And are we building that? Or are we just building our own little dream somewhere on the side? Some question for you to ponder on this next couple of weeks. Are you building what God is building, and what is God's dream for your life? Ask questions. Journal the thought that come to your mind. There's this sacred, secular divide in our, in our world. This part of my life is the sacred part. This is the holy part when I relate with God, when I come to church on Sunday, but my making money, my business, my schooling, that's the secular part of my life. That is a bulldoze, a rubbish all our lives are sacred. In the garden, there was no separation of sacred and secular. Everything was sacred. As a follower of Jesus, if you don't remember anything today, I want you to remember this. As a follower of Jesus, you have a bi-vocational calling. First, to work, to create, to steward, to take care, to organize, to do Microsoft Excel, to, do, to lead, to parent your children, to study, like it was in Eden, you need to subdue the things that have that God has entrusted you. To do it with excellence for the glory of God, not for the glory of yourself. Then, on the on the other side of it, and the, the same sacredness level of it, to be a vessel like Peter was, on which God can build His church upon, to go and make disciples as you are being discipled in the house of God, to build His family, to build a church 
that somehow bring about blessing and 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 the kingdom of blessing in the cursed world, ushering the great, the gracious presence of Jesus in our city. And we cannot separate those two. It is the same level of sacredness on a Monday as you do your presentation for your board, and on a Sunday as you make sure the toilet is clean, as you put on those Halo Crew lanyard and you greet people at the door. There's the same level of sacredness as you wake up at 2 a.m. changing nappies for your baby, burping them with eyes almost asleep. There's the same level of sacredness with that and on a Sunday when you're singing the beautiful songs of there's the same level of sacredness as sacredness as you as you do your research for your paper in university and you and as you serve the toddlers in kids church on Sunday. Laura and I often say to each other, you know what? If even if I'm not employed by the church full time, I would still want to do these things that I'm doing. My heart, my life is for God. Whether I'm working full time for the church, whether I'm working doing my own business. I am living full-time for Jesus. So blessed people, here is your identity. You belong to God. You don't belong to this world. You belong to God. This world and all its desires and all its ambitions will fade away. But the kingdom of heaven is the one that will stand still the test of time. Your surname is hope. Even in the darkest time, you can have a blessed assurance that Jesus is yours and you belong to him. Even when you grieve, you know, in this cursed world, we do grieve. Even Jesus wept. We do experience pain. But because you are, you belong to God, you can make sure that you grieve as those who have hope. You do not grieve as those who do not have hope. You have a hope. You have an assurance of the future. Revelation 22, this is the end picture. No longer there will be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city and His servants will serve Him. In the new heaven, in the new earth, we will continue building cities, civilizations. There is no retirement day. There is just no baggage of anxious toiling. Isn't that amazing? They will see His face and His name will be on their foreheads. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I, my Savior, am happy and blessed. You cannot untangle the knot of anxiety and the, the trap of anxiety of your life when you are still on the throne of your life. A submitted life is a peace-filled life. Make Jesus the Lord of your life this year, not you. Resign from it. Make Him the Lord. 2024, may this year be a year where you experience the wholesome, soulful productivity. Oh, that sounds good. Without the baggage of anxiety. Because you're building what God is building. Because daily you remind yourself and you resurrendering yourself every day to God. And say, God, you're the Lord on Monday, tomorrow, as you go back to your work, Lord, you're the Lord over this work. Let me do this work for your glory. May there be a sense of favor and blessedness this year as you go back and do your responsibilities as you continue building your family, building your study, building your work. As you, Even if you're in the retirement today and you're watching this, may there be a sense of blessedness and the favor of God. May your hearts be filled with gratitude as you receive the gift of undeserved blessing. And you say, how did I get here? That's been so good for me. May the 2024 be a blessed year for you. The Lord bless you and keep you. May His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn His face toward you and give you peace, which trust Him with your time, with your talent, with your treasure. Make Him the Lord of your life. God bless you.